This episode features Emeritus Professor Joseph McGewick, an engineer at the University of Edinburgh. Due to technical difficulties, this interview might not have quite the same content or quality that we usually strive to deliver, but we're sure that you'll find it interesting. Enjoy listening! You're listening to Insight, the University of St Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I'm your host, Samuel Avery. Join us as we journey into the lives of St Andrews academics, discovering their passions, inspirations and motivations. So today on Insight, we have the pleasure of sitting down with former Regis Professor of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh, Professor Joseph McGill. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure, Sam. So could you just tell us what it is that you do or what was your position at the University of Edinburgh? Well, I, I, was, I, I was appointed to the Regis Chair of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh way back in 1983. And I have here in the room from which I'm speaking the royal warrant that came from Her Majesty. And that, that was a very, obviously it's a very prestigious appointment. At that time there were, in, in Scotland anyway, there were only two Regis chairs. One was here in the University of Edinburgh, another one was at my alma mater in the University of Glasgow. Um, there are Regis chairs of other subjects, law, medicine, but there were only two Regis chairs. In the Edinburgh one, was established um, in the middle part of the 19th century. And in connection with that, um, I'll probably speak later about my presidency of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, but the two pioneers of railway traction in the UK in the building of the railways were two people called George Stevenson and Robert Stevenson. And they sent, the, the father, they, 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 built steam, they, they built the steam locomotive called the Rocket, and they built the railways. And George was planning to hand over the family business to his son, Robert. And he sent Robert to the University of Edinburgh to study STEM subjects, science, mathematics, chemistry, geology. And on the basis that by studying those subjects, they would learn more about the steam, the science behind steam and the chemistry. Um, geology was obviously to give them a grounding in how to, where do you put railway lines? Knowing that they would come back, that Robert would then come back to Newcastle and they would have the engineering and the technology to build their, their steam locomotives. And interesting enough, they also sent their apprentice, Gooch, to Edinburgh University also to study. And that was that was before that was actually before there was any chair of technology or chair of engineering. And I understand that the professors of physics, chemistry and mathematics approached the university principal at the time and said, look, with all this work going on in terms of an industrial revolution, we really should have a chair of of engineering. And the principal of the university um, approached Queen Victoria and they got an industrial, an industrial who lived in Dundee called, I think his name was Baxter, and he put out a big endowment, I think something like £5,000, uh, and a smaller donation from, from the Crown, and that's what established the Regis, it was first of all called the Regis, Regis Chair of Technology, and then it became known as the Regis Chair of Engineering. And I, I was the seventh holder, the seventh holder of the chair. So that's the background to how, how it all started. Um, it's very, it's, it's very, it's very. Obviously, it's, it's, every every day that I held the office, I was conscious of kind of holding this appointment, um, and I took part in not just doing my job, um, but also, in any case, putting my name forward to take part in university functions, and I think on two occasions I also presented students for their degrees at the university graduation, just as you will do later, hopefully. So so I would, I would attend many functions as the, as the Regis Chair, but mm -hmm. apart from that, I had to get on with my job, which was teaching and research, and also uh, linking with industry, which is something that actually an engineer has to do. Yeah, so obviously it's, it's a very illustrious position, and that's sort of in recognition of the 
respect that you garnered as a researcher up to that point. So could you tell us where you studied your undergraduate degree and what was your path then to the University of Edinburgh? I lived in Stevenston, in Ayrshire. Um, I went to primary school in Stevenston. I went to secondary school called St Michael's College in Irvine. Um, and then at that time, there were only four universities in Scotland. Um, and really, the custom was that you went to your local university. And uh, I had very good teaching in physics, chemistry, mathematics, um, also, also like Latin. Um, and but there was a, I think it was the teaching. I had fun actually. Latin, Latin was my it's funny. I, I get prizes for Latin. And my Latin teacher wanted me to go and study Greek as well, to higher Greek. But even at that time, I was more inclined to um, to the sciences. Um, here's a bit of here's a bit of a an when I was doing, I had to do higher mathematics. Go to university. I had to do science, which is physics and chemistry. But when I was doing my preparation for my higher mathematics, I was finding the higher mathematics papers quite difficult. Sitting in my room at home in Stevenston, and um, I, uh, I had a go at the kind of lower level. Uh, it's called lower mathematics. It's O levels now, and I found them quite quite easy. I remember the next morning going up to see the maths teacher, really finding higher maths. The preparation of finding higher maths, those past papers were actually quite difficult. Would you mind if I just uh, went and did lower mathematics instead? And his reply was, nonsense, boy, go back to your seat. <laughs> so you had to uh, back up and get on with it, I guess. So, when I, when I, so I had to buckle down and go on with it. Um, and I, uh, when I got my hard mathematics, they didn't congratulate me. All they said was, you want to be ashamed of yourself, boy, talking like that. Tough love, tough love. Ouch. And um, so off I went. So I went to, and initially I travelled up and down because you, you could take the train from uh, from Stevenson. But by the way, I should say, um, my my parents, my father was an electrician, but he had this. Uh, my mother, like most mothers, always, they never worked, but they had this kind of vision of education, um, and and um, of my of. My four brothers uh, and I and my sister all went to university, you know, and my other brother, he went, to, he went into business, like the other side of my family. But, but anyways, that, 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 that's, a, that's a very Scottish thing, you know, this kind of value that education, higher education can bring. Um, and there were, all, there were only four universities. So I, initially I stayed in Stevenson. I travelled up, usually the seven o'clock train every day. To the University of Glasgow. The university, I had to come up, I had to take either the tram or a bus, and I travelled back down after a mile, and I did the science, the basic sciences. There was a tradition too, boys went and did science, and I, I did I, 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 I did science. Um, I did phys- physics, um, I did astronomy, uh, I, rather than chemistry, um, and I did I had to do mathematics, but those were my three first year subjects. So that so that so my my subjects were I actually coupled it with astronomy. So I did astronomy and natural philosophy. That was my those were, that, that was my but that was my other subject. And um, and here's another interesting thing. Part of that was that I got a chance as an undergraduate to go to the Royal Greenwich Observatory, um, where I. There were something like 16 students from all over the UK, one or two from overseas, came and had a chance to work in the Royal Greenwich Observatory, working with a professional astronomer. Um, and I, and our job was to, the job was to photograph the sky. And over, over the over over the eight weeks, there, one of the students on this course was Stephen Hawking. Amazing. Yeah, and it was it was it was bright and breezy. You know, but what is we're all 20, 21, you know, years old. And it was bright and breezy, you know. And um, and um, and many many years later, um, there was a I was at a European Community Research Meeting in Brussels, and this woman came up to me. She said, "But were you in that uh, that year that we're all in the Royal Greenwich Observatory?" I said, "Yeah, I was." And I said, "Stephen Hawking there?" She said, "Yeah." But I, I no ever I never actually ever saw him again. Um, 
And there were two of us from Glasgow University went to this course. Um, we used to talk, we, used to, we, we stayed in Hirschmongsu Castle, which was that time the home of the Royal, Royal, Royal Observatory. Um, and I, uh, but you used to talk, a lot of it was really pure science. I remember one persistent question was, was, the, was the red shift a Doppler effect? Um, and, but in some ways, it, I remember thinking, I, I don't really care whether, it's a, whether the red shift is a Doppler effect or not. Um, and um, but that was that was the when I wasn't when I didn't do that I worked every summer in ICI. My father had me registered as a as an electrician's apprentice, a vacation apprentice, and I would go and work in ICI again, clocking in at seven thirty in the morning and clocking out again at five five at night. And I also did some vacation work down at Corsair Radar um, in Harlow, in Essex, one summer. So in some ways, it, it was combining. When I look back, a kind of practical training with looking at looking at pure science, um, and I got uh, I graduated in with a BSc in astronomy and natural philosophy. I'd actually applied for a couple of jobs in the industry. I know the Hoover Hoover at that time they had a branch in Blantyre in Scotland. Cam is lying, and I'd gone there at the vacation, and they'd offer me a job, and also. I was offered a job by in the radar, um, one of the Smith Smith Sally, Smith radar down in Cheltenham. Um, but the next day I was out to Westerlands, which was the University of Glasgow training ground, with a friend of mine, and because uh, I'd done athletics all year, all, all my term. And he said, "What?" And he said, what, "What? What are you doing?" So I said, "Well, I'm not too sure." Um, I said, "I feel like I didn't do any competitive athletics in my final year," and uh, I said, "I've really missed it." And he, this guy had started a PhD the year before in mechanical engineering. And he said to me, he said, why don't you? I said, I really missed, I said, I've been offered these two jobs in the industry, but I really, uh, this year's been quite tough, quite hard. He said, why? He said, my professor in mechanical engineering is looking for people to come and do PhDs. Why don't you come down and have a talk with him? So I went down to see the professor of mechanical engineering, Professor George Douglas Stephen McClellan. Um, professor McClellan, uh, told me about what he wanted doing, and he also said, I remember saying to him, is it, is it relevant to industry? And he says, you'll find this is very relevant, industry want this technology. Um, he said, well, I want you to go and talk to a couple of other of my colleagues who are doing material science as well. And I went and talked to them, and they were, they were, they were offering PhDs in material science. And then, and then I went back and I saw him, and he said, well, what would you, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I'd like to do what you, your subject, and it was called electrochemical machining, and it was used in the aircraft engine industry. And McClellan said to me, well, he said, uh, but this time was a kind of Friday lunchtime. He said, I don't want you to decide now. I want you to go home and talk to your friends, talk to your parents, talk to your family, and then would you like to come back in the next day? And, um, and, and at the start of the next week, I went back in, and so on Monday morning, and his secretary said, oh, yes, I went and knocked his secretary's door. He said, oh, yeah, the professor's been wondering if you would come back. And, um, and I went and saw Professor McClellan, and I said I would like to do a PhD with him in electrochemical machining. So that's, that's how it all began. So um, it's a message too. Sometimes doors close, but usually if you're, if you're, if you're open, and I've, I've, I've done two things. Young colleagues of mine who... who have been turned down or they've been blocked. I said, well, you know, wait, wait, wait for the opportunity. You know, you know, failure is not fatal. But wait, wait for the opportunity. Some, something, something will come up that you really want. And I, I found that was very much to my liking. Um, so the rest is is history, as they say. Um, well, the rest was history, and that set me in a, in a course of, you know, of mechanical engineering, and therefore my PhD. Was in was in engineering, um, and I think the world is much more. The world of science and engineering is much kind of broader now. I mean, that, you know, so go, go, go back to go back to the two Stevensons. It wasn't engineering that George Stevens sent his son to study. It, it was it was science. It was science, and the science and the technology and the engineering. I think mathematics is actually very important. 
But I think I think physics is an extremely uh, powerful um, subject to study. Um, the professor of business studies at Edinburgh University, when I came here, shortly after I came here, um, it turned out he had a PhD in theoretical physics from Oxford, and he done a first. He told me he did a first degree in physics at Oxford, um, and I said, "How, Lynn? How did you come to do what you did?" He said, "Well." He said, I found in my, doing my PhD, a lot of it was what we now know is what's called operational research. And, um, and I met, along the day, I met, I met mathematicians and I met physicists who operational research, which is a, a kind of vehicle of business. Um, and they've, they've moved one way or the other, either into engineering management or in, in his study, into business studies. So for people that do physics, mathematics degrees, yes, I think if you're not interested in the pure stuff, and basically I, I wasn't, I think, I wasn't interested in pure science. Um, I was far more interested in the in the applications of it. So, so if you have this background and this knowledge and the desire to apply it, there's really a, a wide range of things that you can go into. And and your PhD was on um, electrochemical engineering or electrochemical machining, sorry. So what's your sort of favourite thing about that, about that field of research? What's something that makes it stand out to you? I think, I think, it, was, I think it was the cross-disciplinary nature of it. It required me, and I hadn't, I hadn't studied fluid mechanics as an undergrad. Uh, so I, 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 I had to learn the fluid mechanics. As I explained to you, I, I hadn't done it, you know, I hadn't done chemistry. When I looked back, uh, because I'd gone and studied astronomy instead, um, because a friend of mine has said, if you if you got it, if you do chemistry, you've got my my brother uh, said chemistry at uni, and you do you do do labs twice a week. Maybe it's the lazy side of me, my friend. You know, you could avoid doing two labs a week if you did, if you didn't do chemistry. And Glasgow University was broad enough that it gave you this kind of um, you, you know you you choose what you want, you choose what you you think your main subject is going to be. But apart from that, choose another subject. Um, so in some ways, also I think I think the undergraduate degree, the breadth of it, um, the physics was good. Um, it was pure, but it was good. The astronomy was actually quite mathematical, um, and a lot of it was dynamics as well and mechanics. But it was to me, it was actually quite mathematical. Um, but I knew at the end of it, I certainly you know the fact that I was turned down to do a PhD in astronomy was prosy. You know, not, not, not only was it a blessing in disguise, it was a blessing. Forget the disguise. Of the... <laughs> so the really interesting thing about the research is, is that it's still intellectually challenging and you're looking at these new areas. Um, so, so moving on, actually, you've just recently served a term as president of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. So can you tell us a bit more about what the, the Institute stands for and what it's about and how it came to be, maybe? Well, sir, it's, it's, a, it's called an institution. It's an institution of mechanical engineers, um, and it's been in the go now for well nigh, oh heavens, coming up, I think it's 175th anniversary in two, two years' time. Now, I, actually, at that time, because, because my first degree was not, was not in engineering, it was not in mechanical engineering, um, I, I'd gone, I say, I had, I had vacation training, um, and also I, I get, after I graduated, I worked in Newcastle, but Having good, I had a kind of hankering to go back into university work, and I applied for a lectureship in. I applied for two or three lectureships and didn't get them. Um, and then I applied. One came up in Aberdeen University. In, they were looking for a lecture in thermodynamics. I, I hadn't done thermodynamics since I'd been an undergrad. The PhD there's a bit of kind of thermodynamics in it, but I applied for it, and I, I got I got the job. And so then that's where why Brendan and I we, we were married and then we went up and we started our married life in in, in Aberdeen and Marshall College, um, and so that that was me on the academic route, um, and of course the the sequence is I had to do my teaching. Incidentally, the, the 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 head of the Department of Engineering was a man called Professor Charlton who again was one of the old school. He'd been in industry in Newcastle. Uh, he'd been at Cambridge. Um, he'd been at 
Queen's University in Belfast, and then they'd come to Aberdeen as his head of the department. Um, and he was interested in engineering science. But when I arrived there, he said, look, he said, he said, we need somebody to teach material science. I know you've been appointed here to thermodynamics. So would you mind doing setting up the course of material science instead? And um, and my view was if Professor Charlton wanted me to teach material science and set up the materials course, that, that was fine by me. But here's another message. Um, be prepared for the unexpected. Um, opportunities come. If your boss wants you to do something, you, you do it. Um, and he'd obviously realised from my PhD subject that I had to work with metals. Because air, aircraft engines are made of exotic materials. Um, and that, that's what I did. So the thermodynamics was put behind me. Um, and I ended up setting a course. Um, but it also meant, this is going back to the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Um, I realised that if I wanted to go up the academic ladder, and if I wanted a chair in engineering, um, I really needed to be a member of the professional engineering body. And in my case, it was going to have to be the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. And, and I, I, didn't have a, I didn't have a first degree in mechanical engineering. My first degree was in science. And I applied to join the Institution of Mechanical Engineers to become what we'd call a chartered engineer, chartered mechanical engineer. I was, I was actually turned down first time. They said, you, you don't, you don't, your, your initial qualification isn't in engineering. And they said, you'll have to do a, a course that's called the Engineering Society, a bit of law, a bit of social studies. Um, if you're going to, you're going to become a charter, if I was going to become a chartered mechanical engineer. By that time, I had children. My research work was, I was getting on with it. And I thought, crumbs, I don't I don't really have the time to take some course in order to, so I put it to, I just put it to one side and I got on with the things that to me were most important and that was, um, you know, first my family had, I had to, I had to have money come in to pay for them, I had to do my teaching, sit the exams, do my research and uh, so I, I, I just left it to one side and then I applied a couple of years later and this time, you know, with what was then becoming quite a, you know, a more substantial curriculum vitae, especially the work with industry. I mean, they just they just let they just let me in without me sitting any exam. I think they'd forgotten about they'd forgotten about it. You know? <laughs> and um, so at Aberdeen, I I became a senior lecturer, uh, and then I became a reader, a reader and engineer. And then the custom there was if you wanted if you wanted chairs, then you had to you had to go after them and. Um, and, uh, and I, I applied for some chairs. I, I didn't get them. Applied for some, whereas, but at that time the, the whole system's changed much more. Kind of, but basically, that 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 one, the Regis Chair in Engineering, was really an extremely uh, prestigious. It, it still is, still is prestigious, and that's why I came to. And and again, um, when my CV was being scrutinised, as it was. It was noted that by that time I had become a fellow of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. It was noted. Mm. Nothing was said at interview. It, nothing was said, but within, I know, accreditation, all engineering degrees at universities have to be accredited yes. by the professional engineering bodies. And a short time after I came to Edinburgh, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers arrived to accredit our degrees. And the fact that the head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, which I was then, um, I served for eight years as its head of department. The fact that the, I was a, a fellow of the IMEC obviously uh, helped to, you know, to, to get it through. Um, and from there, I started to take a greater interest in the professional administration of the IMEC I uh, went to local meetings here in Edinburgh because it, it was important for the head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering to be seen. Um, I joined the Scottish branch of the IMEC and became its chair. Um, later on, 
I became, from there, a member of the Council of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, and I became a vice president of the IMECI. So I was starting to get au uh, fait with the administration of the IMECI. And it in February last year, I was approached by the then president um, to say that uh, you, you're eligible, you, stood for, you were a vice president for four years. Uh, you chaired our international board, you chaired our publishing board, because they publish magazines, and therefore would I wish my name to go forward. And that, that's how it happened. Um, that, that, so the year just finished, as of last Wednesday, was... So that's, that's at the end of May, for listeners. So that, that was the end of May. And that, that was running non-stop, seven days a week, on call 24 hours a day, my iPad, my, my laptop... Uh, my mobile phone were on the whole time in order to deal with it. Mm-hmm. I was either in London and I had a London had an office there uh, within the IMEC. It's just across from the Houses of Parliament. Um, I was out speaking to um, IMEC groups all around the country. Um, I think almost my first one after I started was actually to. I came to Glasgow, the Scottish I make, he asked me to take part in a panel discussion. We were having a meeting with the the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Um, I went to the Welbeck Defence College just outside Loughborough because they they have students, the Ministry of Defence are big supporters of the IMECI, attended their prize giving. Um, and so when I wasn't in London, I was up and around the country. Um, speaking, presenting prizes, seeing what was going on. Uh, and here's something of interest for somebody with a physics background. We're going to Cullum Laboratory, um, the Cullum Research Laboratory, um, again, presenting certificates to people who become chartered mechanical engineers, like me, just many years before, and seeing the international activity that was going on in terms of energy, fusion. Mm-hmm. Countries that were politically each other's throats, um, the Chinese, the Russians, the Americans, the Europeans, the UK, India, um, all this collaborative effort going to find uh, a new source of energy. Um, and, you know, and the, the man you showed me around was, 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 was from Canada. He, he, was, he was quite frank. He said, well, the politicians want us to have something ready by 2040, 20 years time. He said, I, he said, I don't think, he said, I think it's unrealistic. He said, but we're really, really going for it if we can. Um, I, I was in Dublin. Um, I went and visited Engineers Ireland there in Belfast. Um, some of the Yorkshire branches, Manchester to the Manchester Museum with a big annual dinner. I spoke there. Um, and again, I was due to be in Hong Kong and made China um, and then lockdown occurred and British Airways cancelled all flights mm-hmm. so I wasn't I was supposed to go there for something like some three or four weeks touring around because um, that was cancelled and instead I did my presidential lecture by Webex in, in Hong Kong and the, the title of that was How Theo Williamson Fellow of the Royal Society Changed the Sound of Music so obviously your presidency of IMEC E has taken you to a number of different places and allow you to get insight into different areas of engineering. But I was wondering if there were any areas of engineering that you thought were really interesting. It really has been a, a very stimulating experience to travel around, especially the UK, um, and deal with our overseas visitor or overseas members. Um, I think it is the international aspect of engineering that really has uh, struck me as to how people actually can can work together. If you'd asked me this question six months ago, my answer would have been different. But the COVID, the COVID epidemic really has focused me on how especially engineers and mechanical engineers really can deal and c- contribute solutions to dealing with this problem. Um, I'm now actually chairing a task force on behalf of my success of the new president of the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, 
who asked me to chair a task force by how mechanical engineering can deal with the coronavirus. And that's taken me into um, teams, um, but dealing with aspects such as how do you deal with transport and protect people using transport? Our colleagues in hospitals, how they deal with uh, that, airflow and how this uh, virus is carried. And believe it or not, just the other week, talking to uh, a colleague in Dubai who were concerned about how the virus is actually transmitted uh, by dust kicked up by car tires and roads. Um, how is the virus transmitted through wastewater? Um, how can you do modelling? And again, one of my young colleagues has been doing modelling for some of the scientists who are feeding into SAGE, um, for which the, the decisions are, are, are made to, to both the Scottish government and also to the, the Westminster government. So this is actually thrown up to me, uh, you know, a number of areas, you know, the, the, the virus will be, will be tackled. But if you'd asked me this, as I said, if you'd asked me this question six months ago, I'd have given you a totally different answer. Um, will, I will, will I continue in that area? Um, I'll suggest to others, actually, you know, you know how they can carry on, because, but in a kind of global, a more global view, you know, what, 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 what are the big problems that face the world? Um, everybody needs food, everybody needs agriculture, and uh, robotic farming will come in, and, you know, and that's, robotics actually is a very much, a, a, you know, 21st century um, development. I know it started last uh, you know, in the last century, um, food and agriculture, the engineering for that. I would also look at nano manufacturing, nano engineering. And that's where people coming from a science background, physics and chemistry, um, really where, they, they, and that's why SAGE, uh, not SAGE, but um, STEM is actually so important. And again, the, the challenges that are raised by uh, medical engineering in the 21st century, uh, Alzheimer's, um, Parkinson's disease, care of the elderly, and again, those are those are areas that really, if if you ask me, I think those are the areas where um, you know where, where major contributions uh, can be made. But at this stage in my career, um, if somebody came to me like you and asked me, you know, which areas to look at, those are the areas that I would think are you know are are those that are going to be needed. And I think whatever. Um, Engineering you go to, the, the motto the, the, for the Institution of Mechanical Engineers is improving the world through engineering. And I think it's, and that's why I think the, the, the global academic community um, really are able to work together to help to improve uh, the, the world through engineering. So I hope that answers the questions in, in, in some ways. Yeah, I think it does. And I think what that highlights is that as much as COVID is a part of everyone's life at the moment, engineering is really a part of every aspect of someone's life as well and all those different areas that you just touched mm -hmm. upon. Um, so one of the ways that we disseminate information about academic subjects is through textbooks. And you yourself have actually offered or, or co-offered a number of textbooks. So what do you think that the value of having them is to academics? And I think e-books offer uh a much more uh, readily available uh, source of information. And I think textbooks will always be needed. They'll always be needed. Um, yeah, I, I, I increasingly use Google for, essentially for, for instant information to get a grasp of, of a subject. But the, the more detailed areas, um, I think still require textbooks. Going back to the Institutional Mechanical Engineers, last one of my opening responsibilities was actually to open the refurbished uh, library in London, in Birkage Walk. And in preparing for that, I mean, the, the, the library is literally full of books um, covering all aspects. Um, physical books, yes. Um, E-books, I think, in the particular. But I think there will always be a need for them. And if I may actually just comment again, um, 
you've come to you've come to the university from St Andrews and also, but um, almost two this this two hundred years ago was the birth of somebody called Rankin. And he was the, he was one of the four founders, three founders of, of thermodynamics as we know it today. Um, and the nineteenth century, he he studied in Edinburgh University um, maths and the science, the the, the the STEM subjects. He put into industry, and eventually became uh, a university professor, into a, a Regis professor in Glasgow University. And he wrote, he wrote the standard textbooks, essentially dealing with engineering as he, as he saw it. And they were used well into the 20th century. And, he's, and that, that was the kind of, these were the kind of reference books. So I, th I think there will always be a need. There will always be a need for textbooks, of whether in electronic form, probably more and more so, uh, but also books where people can refer, where, where people write up, the, um, write up the subject in which they've got... Uh, experience. And I know actually as a, as a young lecturer when I went to Aberdeen University, my head of a department in engineering there, it was he who, I, I, I told about this kind of idea for a textbook dealing with um, my main research subject at the time, electrochemical machining. And it was he who persuaded me to do that as a young academic. And it covered theory, it covered experiment and research findings. And it took me the best part of, uh, I don't know, probably the best part of a, a year, as well as doing my lectures. But in a strange kind of way, my, I, I, I told about this kind of tough um, supervisor in Queensland when I went, and I, I sent him a copy of that, and he told me that he had found it, the, the, the combination of theory, experiment, and industrial use, um, he had found it, very, showed great insight into the subject and I think the role, the role, that, so the short answer to your question is there will always be a need for textbooks. So, so part of the value is, is having that real depth of knowledge and part of the value is, is being able to carry that knowledge far into the future then. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's one thing that you've done and you know we've covered it a lot. The other is uh, presidency of, of IMEC-E and uh, Regis Chair of Engineering at Edinburgh. Um, so this is quite a prolific career. Um, but what is something that is? Is there anything you can pick out that you're particularly proud of having achieved? I think two things. I, I, I think it, it, it's seeing your research is being applied in industry. Now that, 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 that's the difference. That's the difference. Uh, I mean, my, 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 my first degree, as you know, was, was essentially pure science. Um, but to me, at the end of that course, I realised I was becoming more and more interested in applications. And industry, and therefore, and that kind of steered me really into applications. So the thing that actually really I like that turns me on, so to speak, is seeing my work being applied in industry. And somebody came, somebody I mentioned this book. Somebody came and did a joint PhD with me from Phillips in Holland, and he had seen my he had seen my uh, he had seen this textbook that I'd written. And he used that for the basis to turn to make use electrochemical machining, making razor blade foils for what became known as the Phillips shaver. And that, and I, you know, that was done without my knowledge. So, you know, and then he came and did a PhD part time with me and a young colleague um, when he, he did all his experiments in Phillips. So, see, seeing the work being applied, and I must say, I, I, I do enjoy uh, collaboration with industry. I really, I really do see it being used. I think the other side is seeing my former students go and do well. Um, even, even just a few days ago, um, out of the blue, there came a call from somebody called who had Mr. Chen, who'd come and worked with me in my laboratory in Edinburgh. He'd end up doing an MPhil, a, a master's by research with me. Um, he went into industry and then he made his way back to Shanghai and he uh, set up a business there. And he got it, he suddenly told me that he had now retired and he had come back and he was now living in London. And again, other students have, and see, seeing them do well, I think, and seeing the, the results, even earlier on in my presidency of the IMEC, I was 
chairing a, a lecture, a big lecture in London. And right at the end of it, somebody came up to me and they said, you won't remember me, he said, but you lectured to me shortly after you came to the University of Edinburgh. And some of the guys, well, thanks for getting in touch with me too. So I think th th those are the things that give you cakes. Um, you, you know, the things that actually make, make you realise that it's actually all worthwhile. The, but at the end of the day, a, a, lot of, a lot of it's hard work. You know, it's a lot of time. Um, and there, there's no... There's there's no there's there's no um, easy way actually in, in doing these things. They all you know, whether whether you're whether you're Andy Murray playing tennis. Um, I mean, it's all hard work with Andy. I mean, he went to Spain when he was 15 to a, a te, you know a tennis uh, camp, um, or Usain Bolt, or or whatever. But it, it's all hard work. But those those are the things. And again, I say it's particularly uh, former students coming back, getting back in touch, and uh, sometimes also tell me about the problems too, and uh, you know, and, and talking through, you know, what, what, what could be the solution, as well as tell me about their achievements. So something that sort of stands out, out from that is sort of the, the community aspect almost of academia, whether that's the industry and academia community or that's right. stu students mm -hmm. and, and people who come after you in mm -hmm. the same research spheres. Mm -hmm. um, so you've worked and researched uh, a number of universities all around the world, and I was wondering if any of them stand out to you for being a, a beautiful place to sort of live and work. I particularly enjoyed my year in Brisbane in Australia. Again, at that time, people having done PhDs were the, the kind of fashion was to go abroad for a year. Uh, and I, I was very fortunate to get a postdoctoral appointment for a year in, uh, in Queensland. The, the, the work was good. The supervisor was, uh, he, he, he had high standards. Um, he talked to me a lot. Um, he told me about his experiences. He was the one that directed me. I played a lot of sport um, at the same time because of the climate there. And I, I had been a, I had been a runner in my heyday. Um, but I, I played football too for Queensland University. Um, and also, again, through Professor Bass, he put me into a, 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 a hall of residence. Uh, it was called International House. Uh, where 50% of the residents were, were from overseas, 50% were, were Australians. And I think it was a mix there with people from other countries that actually I too, I found very stimulating. Um, and uh, again, somebody in the corridor across from me, his name was Sam Awoa. He played football for Ghana. Um, he played against Manchester United. He and I became good friends. Um, he played centre forward for Queensland University. I was a defender, or midfield prayer, as they called. But he and I kept, in, and we became good friends. He, he studied agriculture, and he, after he'd finished his course, he, I know he went back to Ghana. And again, there was somebody else called, uh, uh, again, from Queensland, Henning Rasmussen, um, who had gone from Denmark to Interior to Queensland. And again, he was married by the time I got. But again, the international career. And he, he and I, he was, he was an electrical engineer turned mathematician. And I was a physicist, astronomer, come engineer. And he and I collaborated a lot. So the answer to your question was, probably of them all, Queensland probably stands out. Um, I also had a very happy year and finished off my PhD in Leicester. Um, so in the Midlands, and that again was, was different again. But of them all, of my, where have I been for a short time? It's fairly a long time. Um, but the, the world, the world is an interesting place. And no matter where you go, I think you find, you find the good side of it. But, um, no, it's, it's obviously but, excellent to hear you can take the positives from this travel. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the positives of academia generally, I think. Um, so just to finish up our interview, I was wondering if you can say for students and people who are just beginning their career in engineering, what's the best way to network and get involved with other engineers or engineering academics on interesting research topics? I think the I think it's interaction with people. I think that's just so important. 
And I think um, try and see try and see your try and see your supervisor regularly. I I, I used to try and see mine every every week. Doesn't need to be for long, um, but also sharing your sharing sharing your experiences with other PhDs. Um, at the end of the day, um, uh, starting research, um, I, th I think be persistent too. Um, um, personally, uh, I, I, again, the, the coffee room is actually a, a good place within a university to meet other people. But I think I think the whole thing is, is actually try and enjoy it, try and enjoy it, um, accept the setbacks and the problems as well as getting 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 on with the work. Um, I think it's actually quite important to have some other outlet, uh, you know, whether it's walking or uh, fresh air or cycling. But I think it's actually quite important to have some kind of other hobby to, to keep a balance. But um, I think at the end of the day, I think doing, try, try and enjoy it. I, th I think most people say that is one of the few times in their lives, you know, where they can actually do something without the kind of other restraints you know, I, I mean, eventually, I, I, I get married, so they did a mortgage and children, and and um, you know, and uh, a job, but find a topic, and I think interaction with the supervisor actually, I think, is actually very important. Um, go and tell him or her your problems as well as what you've been able to do. I say these these interactions, they, they don't need to be long. But I think it's actually quite useful to your interaction with other fellow researchers to of the same age. Um, the professional bodies, um, yeah, they can be they can be interesting. Um, and again, that's again where networking that maybe comes once you get on to you know, get 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 get, in, get into the subject of your of your research. Um, Personally, I find going to seminars quite interesting. Often listen to what other people say, not necessarily your own subject. You get to that kind of breadth of, of, of interest. But the overall thing is actually try, try, try and enjoy it. Try and enjoy it and try and communicate with your, with your colleagues. Sharing trying your... to enjoy it and, and making use of the people and opportunities you have around you. That's right. Well, I think that brings our interview to a close. So thank you very much, Professor Joseph McGeoch, uh, former Regis Chair of Engineering at the University of Edinburgh. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay. And I wish you well. You've been listening to Insight, the University of St. Andrews Student Physics Society's podcast. I was your host, Samuel Lavery. Thanks to the wonderful academics of St. Andrews. Join us in the future as we learn more of the people making our education. This podcast was produced by myself and our podcast producer, Sabrina Keating. To find out more about the Physics Society and what we do, please find us on Facebook or Google St. Andrew's Physics Society for our website. Goodbye. <laughs>